Welcome, welcome to the Plant Your Seeds of Transformation podcast show. I'm your host, author Donna Marie. You can find me at authordonnamarie.com. Today, I'm so honored and privileged to be bringing, um, I don't know if I can call you Dr. Nia, I want to call you Dr. Nia, but <laughs> Nia Rigel, she's part of RC Wellness brand, and she is going to drop some wisdom and knowledge on us. Black women leaders have a tendency to be very strong all the time. <laughs> we are, and this is, it's embedded in our culture. And so that's just who we are. And there's nothing wrong with being strong until, until things go left and you're not reaching out for support and you're not um, allowing yourself enough grace to be okay the way you are. And so we want to talk about these things here for you all because it's so important for your own mental health and physical health because it's all tied together for your spiritual health, for your relationship health. It's so important to understand these things and think about how you can create your life, plant your own seeds of transformation, not just allowing things to be the way they've always been, but taking um, authority, standing in your own power and making your life look the way that you really want it to instead of letting it default to the way it's always been, the way it was for mom and grandma. And so thank you, Miss Nia. Thank you for coming and joining us today. How are you today? I am blessed. I'm happy to be here. Um, my cup is full, so I'm really eager to share all of the knowledge that, you know, I get to share with my clients and now I get to share them with your audience. And so I'm just really happy to, you know, support a lot of women. Well, we are so blessed to have you and so looking forward to hearing your insights on this topic that I've been talking about through interviews that I've done. And also now I'm interviewing other people on my show. I've talked about toxic perfectionism. What does that phrase mean to you? Um, it, it sounds like productivity for me. Um, it sounds like a way of being. Um, it sounds like the lack of vulnerability. Um, and it sounds like a, a really important, necessary topic to unpack. Lack of vulnerability, you hit that one. So tell me more about how do you help uh, the different, um, uh, and let me ask you, do you work primarily with women leaders, with black women leaders? Who do you primarily support? Yeah, so my population that I support are what you would call high performers. And so high performers are people who are maybe in a top one or 2% or 3% or 4% in their um, career field. Most of them are in some form of minority capacity, whether it be um, a, a woman capacity or a cultural capacity. And so um, what I provide them support with is that wellness piece because they've been so conditioned and um, supported with productivity and success and achievement. And they really lack the understanding and the boundaries and the coping skills to manage their wellness in the process of that. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> that's me um <laughs> you just described me um yeah so I wouldn't necessarily say I'm in the top one or two percent of my field but I am a high achiever um always done well in the endeavors that I've um stepped into career-wise education-wise um and unfortunately I allowed all of my perfectionistic tendencies to take over and and never really understood what that looked like. I didn't know what, what toxic perfectionism looked like. And eventually I came to the end of myself <laughs> and realized I, I started recognizing what it really was. And so in my own experience, toxic perfectionism can look like um, not being content mm -hmm. with your good, that your good is good enough not being happy with your excellence or black excellence or black girl magic, not really believing that it's magical enough or that it's excellent enough. Um, other people call it anointing. 
within the faith-based circle. Sometimes they call it walking in your anointing, but sometimes people don't really believe and it comes out, it shows up in different ways. So how can that show up when you don't really believe that you really are anointed, that you really are called, that you really are skilled, excellent, magical, whatever phraseology the person, you know, tends to use to describe being really good. What, how does that show up for, especially for Black women leaders when they, they don't really believe it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, can I answer the question about whether to address me as a doctor or not? I kind of want to unpack that mm -hmm. a little bit. I think that sometimes people, um, they'll, um, want more explanation around that. So I think that was a great segue to lead into. So the difference yes. between um, me and a, and, a, and a doctor who would be a licensed doctor to prescribe medications, that's the only difference. So I'm a licensed therapist. And so I can do the wellness work. I can do the, um, I can diagnose people, but I can't prescribe medication mm -hmm. as a form of care. And so that's mm -hmm. the only difference. Um, I think it, so it's about a two year difference and about a hundred thousand dollars in cost. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. For me, um, I was willing to sacrifice that because I'm not interested in, in, in the medication part because I am a faith-based person and I believe that medication has its limitations. I think that when we learn to work with our bodies and we really are spiritually in tune, we can heal ourselves. And so part of my uh, uh, designation in being a, a wellness practitioner is that I am a holistic healer. And so I believe in functioning and, and balancing the body out. And then if we can't do that because we all have our limitations, right? Then adding medication as the extra layer of support. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the, that's the only it's, difference. So if they want to see it, yeah. It's like you have layers, spirit, soul, body. Yeah. All of those things are important, but you have to understand the priority to put mm -hmm. on things. And sometimes when, for instance, like with a, a chiropractor helps your body get in balance, let's say that you walk, you walk in to the side or your shoulders are out of, chiropractors kind of help put things back in balance. It sounds like you do something similar. You put things back in balance mentally, spiritually. Is that, is that right? It's, 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 it's a perfect description. And um, so many times when we get to the point where we just need some bereavement, we want, we use medication to kind of walk us out of that. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's what medication was, you know, originally for it. wasn't to fix a problem. It was to help you alleviate the pain while you go through the necessary therapeutic methods to uh, heal it. Mm -hmm. It was for crisis. Yes, it was for a bereavement to allow that space for healing. But now because of pharmaceutical push, you know, that's a big multi-billion dollar company, we kind of are getting the mixed messaging that that's supposed to solve the problem when healing is solved. Not at all. Medication is a help aid in that so that we're, our bodies are balanced. And sometimes uh, by chemically, we don't, we, we can be genetically off balance. And then that's another thing of why medication comes in, but the dose shouldn't be really high. It should be low because you should also be offset and doing the work necessary to get it at that holistic balance. I love that you said doing the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Sometimes people just want a quick fix, which is how sometimes we end up in addictions mm -hmm. and we end up um, physically toxic because we just want to pop a pill, drink whatever, smoke whatever. Um, that lack of balance in that way. Um, what does it do? Oh, and, and I'm not going to start on another question. We can get to it. But the question was lack of balance in that way, in terms of putting things in your body to deal with emotions. We can talk about this later, but just along those lines of what does that do to the balance in your spirit and your soul, not just your body, but your spirit and your soul. But I, I want to make sure that you have time to answer the other question that I asked. Um. So yeah, so in reference of the of, of the other question, um, 
perfectionism for for me so i'm a recovering perfectionist myself um perfectionist was passed down to me generationally um that was the way that my mother um quote unquote was a kept woman right so perfectionism was passed down to me in a form of survival skill so you know one of our biggest things in in, in my faith-based home was to get a good christian husband and by getting a good Christian husband, that means you needed to have your hair done, your nails done, you needed to be able to cook, you needed to be able to be supportive, you needed to have a job, just anything that made you um, desirable, right? Mm-hmm. And so growing up and seeing that and being trained to be uh, a Proverbs 31 woman essentially really is what uh, caused my perfectionism. And, and, and I was successful in it. And so that's the only thing that I knew that I could really be in that space um but as a practitioner where i see perfectionism come up especially amongst women who are in leadership capacities it's really hard to be a woman and be in a position of leadership um Mm -hmm. especially when you're still growing and learning how to navigate womanhood and you know forms of leadership are rooted in masculine ways of being and so we're really we're really uh, dominating in a lot of our spaces. And so showing up in those spaces when it comes to vulnerability was it really isn't something that's nurtured or fostered because we really are trying to operate in a very high level masculine way. And so perfectionism comes into the workspace in professional capacity when we're really not able to be feminine fluidly because it's not welcome. And so we try Mm -hmm. to excel in other ways to overcompensate that. Oh my gosh, you said so much. <laughs> I want to I want to dig into everything. But I'm going to let you I'm going to let you go ahead and continue this thread of um how what way do women end up learning how to cope when they are in when they are let's say they're in leadership or they're striving to get greater leadership how do they end up coping when they know they're not being accepted as is? And so they start feeling like they're not enough as they are. They are feminine, but they're mm-hmm. starting to feel like they're not enough as they are. And they want to continue to move forward in leadership. They feel that call. What are some things that women do to try to cope that aren't necessarily healthy? So I can tell you from a a lived perspective, I can tell you from a a professional perspective. So what I did was I would always have my hair pulled back. Um, I would have a blouse on to cover up any type of, you know, any type of sensuality. Um, I was very articulate in my approach. Um, I really listened more and was obedient rather than Mm -hmm. directive and authoritative. Mm -hmm. And I would try to fit into a narrative. I wasn't trying to be a human who is being on earth. I was trying to be a narrative and trying to stick to that narrative was rewarded. And so Mm -hmm. when I continued to be rewarded for fitting into that narrative, then I got gratification. So it became about, it wasn't about being who I was. It was about achieving a goal it was about Mm -hmm. being a being a narrative and and succeeding in that Um, on a professional capacity and what I help women leaders particularly do is break those walls down because when you gain success in that narrative it's not about the success anymore it's about how how are you coping with keeping up with it and so that's when those maladaptive coping skills cards start to come in and that's where you see you'll be a, a successful person on paper and uh, your life will be destruct- destructive or you oh, just be happy, you know, in mm-hmm. your personal life because you're putting all of your energy into the success narrative and that energy isn't going into taking care of the well-being, which is the, the person behind the scenes. Woo. <laughs> where, do, where do we go from here? Lord, help me. <laughs> we have so much we could talk about here. Yeah. Yeah. I want to stay, I want to stay on this, this topic of coping. Yeah. When you're, when you're not, when a woman who is a leader, she's got a certain level of power, prestige or whatever. 
we've seen people in the media that have hit that wall that have started to break down because they were able to maintain whatever status quo was required of them that gave them whatever reward, whatever carrots uh, they needed. They, they kept following after those carrots, but then eventually they hit a brick wall. We've seen in the media, people breaking down, you know, be it a gold medal or be it, you know, a raise, a bonus, a commission, whatever, you know, stock options, whatever it is. Um, we've seen this happen. So what about the woman who's already hit that wall? She's already found out that that carrot wasn't exactly what she thought it was gonna be. What, what can she do from that um, point? You know, this is gonna change somebody's life because that was a, a really great question. She can forgive herself. Mm -hmm. She can forgive herself for not knowing she can forgive herself for all the time she didn't listen to herself. She can mm. forgive herself for all the time she didn't stand up for herself. She can mm. forgive herself for all the times that she didn't own her value. And I think that those are these, that's why I said it's a very um, purposed question. And then it's on, on the other end of this conversation, somebody is going to really be healed from it because perfectionists, we beat ourselves up so bad for not being ahead of the game, for not being ahead of the curve, for not knowing. But that's the misconception about what we don't understand about perfectionism is, is that it's an act. And so mm -hmm. in the act, you're playing a role. But when you start to peel back those layers and when you get to that point where you hit that, that rock bottom, and I wouldn't even say a rock bottom because that's also really uh, degrading. It's a breakthrough. Uh, when you hit that mm -hmm. breakthrough because you've mm -hmm. gone to that capacity of which you can go to like you perfected your way to perfection right so it's a it's at the, it's a multitude of uh multifaceted experiences you're having you hit your goals right you're sad because you're not happy then you're trying to figure out what the heck went wrong because everything's right um and then you look beautiful mm. you look mm -hmm. beautiful um when i was at my breakthrough um i was beautiful and I remember I was um, I was in the living room and I would sneak off every night. I would wait till everybody went to bed and I would cry. Mm -hmm. Just just put my face in the pillow and I would wail. And I remember um, getting to a point one night where I was like, I literally can't do this because I had boxed myself in so much because this image I had put up that I had no one to go to. And so, mm. and I was beautiful. So nobody could thoughts even ask because I present it really well. You um, have such a perfect life. What yeah. Could possibly be wrong. Yeah, I had the house, I had the partner, I had the kids, I had the career. Um, and I was the most unhappiest I've ever been in my entire life. And I remember, um, it got too much and I said, I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And, um, I remember a voice came over me and it was like, get up. And I was like crying. I can't, like, I, I, I physically had no energy left to wake up the next day and perform. Like I, I didn't. And, um, that voice wouldn't let me, um, give up. And then it showed me a vision of my daughter going to prom and crying because I wasn't there. And of my son who at the time was six months calling somebody else mommy. Mm -hmm. I heard my son voice before I heard my son speak. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that I, I had to heal from too was um, at that time, God knew I wasn't going to save myself for myself. He needed, he knew he needed to show me my, my children. And sometimes we don't have it in us to save ourselves because we've been living for other people for so, so long. Mm -hmm. But even with that, that was scary because how come I didn't love myself so God showed me me? 
So that was another thing that God was revealing to me that I wasn't even the, I wasn't even the picture. I wasn't even in the picture of my perfection. It wasn't, oh, I was God. that gone and disconnected from um, me being a human. Um, and so for me, after hitting a very clear space of reality, I just allow, and this is where we get into the spiritual aspect, aspect of it. I just, for me personally, I just allowed God to do what he needed to do to heal me. And he took everything. He took the house, he took the car, he ended the relationship. Um, he changed the career, he did everything. And it was a stripping that I had to go through. But see what perfectionists have to understand is they built that narrative outside of who they truly are. Mm -hmm. And so in order to end the suffering, the story had to come to an end and it didn't feel good. It, it feels like a failure. It feels like you've done all this for no reason. But the only thing that um, God kept telling me is you have to trust me. You got to trust me. You got to see past the smoke and mirrors and you got to trust me because everything that you built, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And so... Um, you know, I don't like to push spirituality or, 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 or uh, religion on people. That's not my place. But I have to be honest about what my experience was and what my story yes. was. And that those things definitely did happen to me. Um, and I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't had if I didn't have that spiritual intervention. Because remember, I had built a fort up so high that nobody mm -hmm. knew I was suffering, but God. And that happens so much. That happens so much. Um, I've seen it so much. And we think that we are fooling somebody mm -hmm. with our facade, but the only person we're really fooling is ourselves because at the end of the day, we're the ones that are going to be most affected by that. Um, one of the things that I like to do through this podcast is talk about the importance of seeing your life not as a wild jungle or tropical forest where everything just kind of grows wild and does its own thing. But you actually have the authority, you have the power to cultivate your own garden of your life. And one of the things that came to mind as you were speaking was the fact that part of cultivating a garden is weeding. Mm -hmm. And some of those weeds are pretty. I've actually seen things before where I couldn't tell if it was a weed or a flower. Part of the process of gardening, especially if, um, for instance, with wheat, they, the Bible, and yes, I do talk about the Bible in the show sometimes. The Bible talks about the wheat and the tear. Apparently the tear are a plant that looks just like wheat. You can't tell the difference until it's time to harvest. Then you can tell the difference. And you have to separate it out because it is not wheat. It's mm -hmm. not. There are parts of our lives that are not really us, that are not who God has made us. And he prunes us if we let him. And it hurts. Mm -hmm. But in the end, that gives us the ability you know, even though we are, we have the authority to cultivate our own gardens, we also have the freedom to allow God mm -hmm. to prune us. We can't do that ourselves. The rose bush can't prune itself. The gardener has to prune it. And Father God is the ultimate gardener. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have responsibility in there, but he ultimately is the gardener. He's the one that provides the sun. He's the one that sends the rain. And he's the one that will prune us if we I, let him, if we let him. Yeah. And it's part of, um, and a, another thing we don't talk about when it comes to women in leadership is feminine divine leadership. We don't talk about the fact that 
God has hand chosen some women to be leaders in their masculine energy, but he never told us to give up our femininity as a result of that. That is a um, man-made construct mm-hmm. that as a form of assimilation, women have ascribed to, especially women in leadership. And part of my you know, divine nature and why I'm here is to reconstruct that narrative for, for women. And I think that if I had not gone through that situation, and had been left with nothing and had to build myself up from the from the ground up with with in partnership with God um that I wouldn't be able to really have the fortitude necessary to like speak to things that haven't happened yet because we're we're just now entering into the age of feminine divine leadership where we've been indoctrinated into these masculine ways of being and that's out of order right so, inside the church and outside the church yeah it's that, pervasive throughout society no matter where you turn people want to fit you into the mold of what they think leadership should be yes but that's not that's not godly that's not godly. And it's necessary for a holistic balance if we go back to holistic balance you know there there needs to be some form of feminine leadership as well because we're nurturers and yes. we are creators. And so if everything's in this very uh, dominant masculine way, it doesn't make space for emotions and emotions are the most natural instinctual thing that beings could even be able to express. And I won't even designate that to a woman because a man has also feminine energy too, but it does take a woman to speak that into those spaces but we've been so traumatized and stigmatized and abused when we did try to- And call weak. Yes, and call weak when we did try to show up in our natural innate essence that we build up a safeguard and a shield. But I tell my women all the time who are leaders, put down the armor. It's not the way to fight. You're not, we're not gonna win matching their enemy energy. What we're going to win in is we're going to win in our ability to hold our value, to speak our truth, to do our works. And if we get rejected for that, it's not rejection, it's redirection, right? It's, it's a place where intuitively you have to be, but the thing that I feel women in leadership don't get really even mentored on because I wasn't mentored on this. It's like, I, again, my uh, journey has been very, very instinctual and spiritual. It, I, I didn't get a degree in this. I didn't get a mentor who told me, and this is how this is supposed to be. Um, it was literally how, as I experienced, uh, you know, dying to myself and letting God lead me, I would have to go into places that didn't serve me to come out with the wisdom necessary to have the conversations. And, and this, I've been on my healing journey for six years um, and now it's all making sense. So I've been walking blindly for that long um, to be able to have the wisdom to speak, to speak from a space of like authority, but this no, no system gave me this. Like I had to experience the system outside of uh, that masculine energy. And so what I've experienced uh, through that and with helping my feminine uh, clients who are really not wanting to keep on that armor anymore is seeing armor as a, in a different way, not seeing it as a protective factor, but a skill that, we, that women possess. Women are very convincing. We're very intrinsic. Uh, we're empowering and motivating, we're uplifting, we're supportive, we're nurturing, we're kind. And it really just has a lot to do with us having the appropriate boundaries. Like I said, I'm gonna go back to owning our value and not in, let anyone speak us out of it, right? And if we get turned away because we choose to operate at that level, that we're mature enough emotionally to nurture ourselves because we don't spend enough time also as women nurturing ourselves. When we do go out there, we get hurt. We want to get into relationships, get married, have kids and do all those things outside of us. That's existential. And again, that goes back to that perfectionist mindset. That's only going to get you so far. What has helped me is when the kids are not here, when your man is not showing up at his best, when you're by yourself, who's taking care of you and how. And I had been so codependent on getting those things outside myself that I didn't even know how to take care of myself, but I was in this leadership capacity. 
And so that's the that's the mixed messaging that was the, the dysfunction and a lot of dysfunction that women are leading in. We are leading other people, but we don't even know how to take care of ourselves behind mm-hmm. closed doors. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I want to see more women leaders talk about is when I take my armor off and I come home, how am I taking care of myself after going through a long day instead of taking yeah. care of others? Yeah. Am I sitting down with a cup of wine <laughs> or a chocolate cake? Yes. You know, um, or some weed or whatever, you know, how is it just escaping? Is it just feeding? Is it just feeding the feeding the vegetative state with Netflix? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. What is it that that we're doing to truly support ourselves yeah. beyond those ways to feel better? You know, and, and I would say that I, I ascribe to some of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the, the chocolate, not necessarily cake, but the chocolate and the Netflix. And I've had to learn how to replace those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also have to give myself grace when I don't, yeah. when I go back to it. And so learning to not beat myself up for that yeah. has been critical in this time because I'm going through a lot of changes and a lot of transitions right now. And I've had to learn to give myself grace. Sometimes taking care of ourselves can look like just giving yourself grace right now. Mm-hmm. Do what you can today, tomorrow, do something else, do better. But that's a high level skill, Grace. Mm. That's a very, very high level skill to have and to possess and be able to also manifest in. Because without Grace, we wouldn't be able to even be creatives. Because if, 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 you, if you think about it, many of us women are the first to do a lot of different things. And so there's not gonna be a degree there's not going to be a mentor. There's not going to be a savior to do everything. At, at some point, you know, we have to take the autonomy to know that we know because we know, to know mm-hmm. that we know because we've done this for us ourselves behind our, our, our backs, or maybe it was a generational uh, a skill that we learned and we were just very proficient in it. I think that you know part of that masculine way of being is is us having to get degrees for everything or to get it accolades and you know i was asked on um a, another podcast interview i was doing what is the difference between success and failure and i said success for me is getting up every day and not getting an award and nobody telling you that you're doing a good job nobody coming home and rub your back and saying you know good thing and still getting up with the same energy every day until you reach your vision and manifest it for them. That's success to me. Failure to me is when you need all of those extracurricular things to be, feel valued and validated for the work that you were put here to already be doing. Yeah. That's failure to me. And so we have a lot of successful people who are failures at the heart. And some of them are not are no longer with us because they feel that. Yeah. Even though everybody else sees them as being the head of their industry, they don't feel it. Mm-hmm. And some of them have not made it to stay with us to today because of that. So that's why I'm really grateful to be bringing this conversation forward publicly because we need to talk about this. So we can save somebody's life, potentially. And continue to hold space for that because that's why feminine leadership is so imperative because we have a lot of people who are suffering, not because they're they're suffering in in silence as a catalyst to it, but because it's not enough feminine leaders hold space for the conversation. Because in masculine energy, we don't hold space for emotions because they're messy, right? And ego says like, no, 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 it's a protective factors not going to want us to explore our emotions but our feminine energy 
is expressive, it's open, it's transparent, it's nurturing, it's messy, it's all these things, you know. Birthing that, babies yes, is the most important messy, thing in the world and it's messy. Beautiful. Yes, all of those <laughs> And painful. Wow. And really, painful. Yeah. It's the birthing of a new narrative. And, you know, to any woman that's listening to this, this podcast and she's feeling intrinsically a calling to really connect with herself on a very deep level as we heal ourselves we heal our mothers we heal our friends i can't tell you how many people i've 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 supported in my immediate group that are my friends who that also were in this perfectionist mindset as me that because i've been able to own my truth and my value that they're now able to own theirs and they're happy. I just had my friend, my best friend text me and she was like, you know what, Nia, I have been neglecting myself for a long time. And hers came from childhood neglect because her mother also too was a perfectionist and she was so worried about presentation that she didn't focus on nurturing. And so she grew up and was just focused on um, being a helper so that she could alleviate people, but she wasn't getting any nurturing. So now she's in a relationship now where she's been able to align with a man who can give her at that bereavement, but she's so used to like being a strong person that even allowing a man to nurture her in a way that even she, even though she intrinsically needs that, it's almost she's like having to die to that narrative of that yeah. she's done everything on her own. And so that's what that's what God will do. He'll give you the very thing you need. And it'll be in a way that you never even thought you needed it. And, and receiving will be the hardest thing you've ever done. And for me, receiving was really hard because I was such a perfectionist because I would hide my pain. And so on the other end of receiving, you have to be transparent. So I I literally would have to negotiate with myself not to suffer in silence <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was Reach like out. it was like we literally can't do this anymore like I had to have a personal boundary for how much I allowed myself to suffer and it wasn't easy to let go so I had to do it in steps like I didn't go like off the board full Monty and be like okay no more suffering in silence it was like okay weigh your pros and cons um so the the one promise i did make myself when i got off off, off that floor because i was like under the floor like i was done that like yeah but it's not the god i got up is that i was never going to go that low again um mm. i had promised myself that like if i was going to own anything in this world it wasn't going to be a house it was going to be a car it wasn't even going to be a man before i own my value and I think that that boundary that I set for myself, like even when I like felt the slip, I was like able to pick myself up because it was like, I never, never, never want to suffer in silence. Cause I, and I always tell people, I don't know what's scarier is the fact that I let myself get that low or the fact that I was beautiful. Mm. I, I don't know what's scarier. So I never, like I had to practice one of the practices, the rituals that I, I do. If if I'm having a bad day, I look like I'm having a bad day. I don't do the coping mm. not looking like you don't have a bad day because it just it's deception. It's manipulation. So so that expression, I don't look like what I've been through. Mm -hmm. You you didn't you sound like you've kind of thrown that to the wayside. And you said, it's I need definitely. to look like what I'm going through because it helps me to be honest. Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It keeps me from going lower because one of my mother's biggest teachings um, in her perfectionist mindset was, I don't care what you're going through. You better not look like it. Yeah. Please I've heard that. That is, that is a black woman mantra. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is a black mother Black grandmother, mantra. Yep. Clean it up, put it together. Yep. Don't embarrass. This is this is one of those other things. Don't embarrass me. Don't embarrass our family. Mm -hmm. Don't embarrass me. You got to put it all together. You got to mm -hmm. put it all together. Yeah. So um, that narrative almost killed me. 
And so um, it, 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 that's, why, that's why I say it wasn't anything that I was doing. It was literally how I was raised. It was, it was my inherited psyche. It was to do that, but um, it was outdated. It was rooted in generational trauma. And it just, as at my intellectual capacity and the, the amount of stress that I was under, it just wasn't serving me. It just, it just wasn't, it wasn't serving me anymore. And so I had to, and that's why the weight was so heavy to like lift because it was a generational narrative. And so I was healing generational trauma and I didn't really understand that until the weight of it got lifted off me. And then I started getting my vitality back. I started feeling like good. And I was like, oh, if this is what releasing feels like, well, what the heck else could I do? And everybody was getting boundaries and I was releasing. And I was like, doing hey. <laughs> and I was speaking from a place of like wholeness and like really being able to like trust myself and the decisions. I'm still in that, in that, in the, in that leg, but I'm not in the thick of it anymore. Um, because I gave myself that space not to be perfect you know and that's what perfection is that's our biggest battle that we're going to have to really own our value in is that we don't have to do that anymore because whether we show up on our best day or our worst day we're still valuable yes absolutely oh my goodness you have said so much and I want to make sure that our audience gets a chance to learn how to get in touch with you and um, I want to point out on the screen, you might see RC Wellness, but it's wellness, rc.wellnessbrand. So I want to make sure you all know to add the W there. And I will leave all of Nia's contact information and her show notes for this episode. And go ahead and let everybody know how they can get in touch with you. And do you have anything going on anytime soon that you wanted them to know about so they could reach out to you about that too yeah absolutely so uh for my perfectionist women out there i got you guys i have a sacred <laughs> healing space um that i hold once a month for high performing women who are also really uh focused on having a, a wellness balance component to their life and so it's not we really focus on not just getting to success but how well we are when we get there um and how much we are in alignment with our authenticity and so we meet once a month every tuesday um and we also have a weekly body processing group where we do fitness and we explore, we talk about um our mindset in in uh fitness and how we feel about it so it's a great way to do that somatic releasing work so if you guys are interested in being a part of that um i'm interested okay great yeah i would love to have you it's a really it's a really great group to have because you're not alone and the conversations are so futuristic and supportive that you heal just by just having the conversation. So yeah, we do that once a month, every Tuesday, and we really are women of integrity who are leading in our femininity and we are natural born leaders and we're unapologetic about being feminine in our spaces. And we just come to this space and we talk about our journey um, and what we've done for the last 30 days to really keep an integrity with that alignment. So any woman who's, you know, looking for a supportive networking group, like they definitely can um, visit the rcwellnessbrand.com and then they can go to my um, Instagram page at rcwellnessbrand and private message me. I'm pretty um, frequent on there with responding. Okay, great. So RC Wellness Brand on Instagram and on Facebook. And rcwellnessbrand.com. Make sure that you all reach out to Miss Nia and sign up if you want to be involved in her Tuesday uh, classes because I know I, I'm so excited. I was recently involved and in, it was actually a Bible study hmm. all about all around the topic of developing a godly body image, hmm. not not focused on necessarily trying to even lose weight, but just understanding how God sees us and incorporating how he sees us into how we see ourselves. And the Bible study is over now, but it was <laughs> awesome. It really was a blessing for me. It really helped me. And it sounds like what you're doing will really help me too. So I'm looking forward to that. 
And um, if you do you have any any books or freebies or downloads or anything that you wanted everybody to know about also? Well, I don't have any freebies, um, but I'm definitely open to conversation. So if anyone just needs quick questions, like I'm just one DM away. So free, feel free to use me as a resource. Um, I do have Wonderful. a workbook that's on Amazon. It's called Revolutionary Healing. Um, it's by me original. So if they wanted to look that up um, in a, in a um, purposeful living workbook, and those workbooks are all around uh, belief systems. Um, they're all about... Uh, really reprogramming the mind outside of uh, our conditioning, kind of separating you from your thought process versus the thought process you've inherited. So if any woman is wanting a soft intro into like the wellness space, those workbooks are a really great intro into that. And then it also has yeah. a contact information on them as well. Awesome. Definitely we'll be looking those up. It has been a wonderful pleasure to speak with you, Nia. And I am so grateful that you reached out and that we found each other and that uh, you were able to be with me today on the Plant Your Seeds of Transformation podcast yes. show. Um, again, I am your host, Donna Marie Johnson. You can find all things about me at authordonnamarie.com. And the show is at plantyourseeds.show or any of your favorite podcast uh, apps from Apple to, uh, to Spotify and beyond. So I hope that you all have enjoyed this. I would love it if you would rate the show. Let me, give me some good feedback on there. Let me know for real, want your feedback. Let me know for real how you like the show. Let me know if you have somebody else that you'd like to hear me interview too. Thank you so much again, Nia. It's been a blessing and a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. All right. All right. Y'all have a blessed night or a blessed day or blessed wherever it is for you, where you are. Take care now.